Okay. So today we're going to talk about auditory fatigue. Samantha, there is a bit of a delay when I okay. click, so that's... That's all right. Rick, hi. What is happening? Auditory fatigue is also, you you might call it your own thing. Um, in the research and uh, professionally, we have seen it called ear fatigue, listening fatigue, concentration fatigue, and cognitive energy fatigue. So you might see and hear that uh, used interchangeably. Right. There we go. Too many. So what is it? It's feeling tired or the inability to listen after putting a lot of effort into listening. It is uh, challenges with your attention, concentration after listening for a period of time. It's a feeling that you can't hear at the end of the day or um, that you need time for quiet. Um, I hear a lot of people come to me described a lot of different ways. Um, I've had people feel like their processor stops working at the end of the day, which one thing you would wanna check is your batteries. Um, but also sometimes it's just the load on the brain cannot process anything more without having a break. So right now, if you guys want to try the chat feature, on a scale of 1 to 10, can you tell me how tired you are right now? So again, the chat is at the bottom with the air bubble. And then you'll see a little conversation at the bottom right of your screen. And um, just see if we have anybody awake out there listening to me. Ignore where it tells you to go to Mentimeter. Good. But I see some ones, which is great because we're just starting, kind of starting the day. Some people may have already been up for seven hours. Some people are at a seven, a three, not tired, one. Good. So why do people... Good. I like seeing those ones. So you're ready to listen and... Um, looks good, a two. So why do people get listening fatigue? Um, Hold on, okay. sorry. You're fine. I, I the, think also when Sandy and I try to both move at the same time, <laughs> we're, we're both advancing it accidentally. That's okay. Go ahead. We are flexible. Um, so we listen with our brains. A lot of people feel like we listen with our ears, which is you know, we'll go into that in the next slide, but our brains are really what are doing the listening. Listening takes effort and our brains have to work even harder when the listening environment is less than ideal. So um, for most people with hearing loss, you're getting a less than ideal signal, even when you have appropriate uh, hearing aids amplification, cochlear implants, and you're in the quietest environment and you have visual cues, you're still getting, still not the most ideal situation. So we'll talk a little bit about the process. So your devices, your hearing aids, your FM or DM system are what provide, your cochlear implants are what provide sound to the ear. Our ear, our cochlea functions as a transmitter and it sends the sound to the brain. The brain decodes that information and does the work. It uses context, experience, different cues in the environment, and then it stores the information. So if your cochlea or your ear has hearing loss, you're automatically degrading that signal and you're making your brain work hard. Um, that is why the use of devices that are appropriately fit um, will reduce that listening fatigue, but it will not eliminate it because the ear still has um, a different signal than, um, than either you were born with or than somebody else that has a normal functioning cochlea.
so it's a lot of work. So when you get a message, you have visual cues that you use. So if that message is degraded or it's a perfect message, you're then using your visual cues. You're looking at facial expressions. You're looking at people's gestures to fill in gaps that you may not hear. Your brain is thinking of the context of what you're talking about. Are you sitting at dinner and the waitress comes up to you? You wouldn't expect her to ask something about your shoes. You would expect her to ask something about something you want or how your meal is. So your brain is using context in the environment. It's also using experiences. It's thinking about the experience of the situation you're talking about. Maybe somebody is talking to you about um, their experience working at a grocery store and you've been to the grocery store and you're thinking about the way it's set up in the grocery store. And then your brain, um, one, of the, one of the pieces missing here is thinking about the sense of the environment. Are you, are you sitting in an appointment and getting some really bad news? Are you sitting talking to your financial advisor about um, maybe a bad investment you made? So your brain is adding stress to the situation or are you chatting with a friend you haven't seen in 20 years and, you know, really catching up and you guys are very comfortable. That stress of the environment is going to affect how well your brain works. And then your brain starts storing what it's hearing. It's thinking about what it's gonna say in response to what you're hearing, and that's getting the message, and that's a lot of work. Sam, would you like to talk a little bit now about um, the impact of masks and yeah. how that contributes to there being extra Absolutely. work? Absolutely, and I'm gonna pull up my slides just because I don't wanna miss, um, miss the uh, accuracy of the information I'm giving you. Um, so over the last year, they've done a lot of research or a few, few people have done research on the effects of masks and what it does for speech. So masks do a few things, three main things. It hides visual cues. It reduces the volume of speech and it degrades the speech signal or the speech quality. So high pitch sounds which are mainly English language consonant sounds are greater, have a greater decrease when a mask is covering somebody's face. Those high pitched sounds, one, don't leave the voice box with a lot of force behind them. Then they're being covered up by a mask. By the time it gets to your microphones or your ears, that signal is more reduced than low pitch sounds. Low pitch sounds in the English language are vowels tend to be more vowels and the M's and the N's. Um, those travel well. Those have a good wavelength and they travel well through air where the high pitches don't. Everybody wants those high pitches. Those high pitch sounds give us the clarity of what's being said. Um, a traditional medical mask. So that's going to be, um, it's, it's not the N95, it's just the traditional procedure mask you see people. So this is not the cloth mask. That is going to reduce sound three to four decibels. And then if you have a healthcare provider or a grocery worker wearing an N95 mask, which are the cone-shaped masks, that can reduce your speech up to 12 decibels. So um, I don't have the research in front of me, but for every few decibels, speech is reduced, understanding can go down 10 to 20%. So you might be a 50% performer when you have dual cues and uh, good speech access, and you reduce that by very few decibels, your 50% now goes to 30%. So in addition to the masks, uh, we also have the effects of our distancing, our social distancing. So uh, everybody wants you to stay six feet away. Well, wouldn't you know, the microphones on your hearing aids and your processors are very, very small and they work optimally six feet of distance. So when the engineers create your technology, they assume you are, you are talking to somebody within a six feet distance. Just like my cell phone, if I talk to somebody on my phone right here, they're gonna hear me very clearly. If I've moved my phone out, two feet, they're going to have a lot harder time hearing me. Um, so 
for every, so here's some numbers and it gets kind of confusing, but for every time somebody takes a, doubles their distance away from you, their speech is reduced by six decibels. So for example, if you are two feet away from somebody and they are speaking and they move four feet away, so they went twice as far, so they're now four feet away, their voice is now reduced six decibels by the time it gets to your ear. So again, thinking you have th you know a few decibels, three to five decibels is going to cause a 10 to 20% decrease in your ability to hear what they're saying. So there's greater impacts to mask wearing. I mean, certainly we wanna stay healthy and we want to, um, we want to uh, maintain social distance and maintain masking. That's not what we're promoting here. But we want you to be aware of that and we want you to take efforts and strategies to kind of overcome some of those issues. Um, all right, Lindsay, you want to discuss, discuss this one? I don't think this was. Sure, yeah, so I think that's a really important point that Samantha was just making. So keeping in mind as you're thinking about your own personal auditory fatigue that masks and our safe six feet of distance are going to make you feel a lot more tired than if you're listening without them. So it's just something to consider as you're going about your day. So Samantha and I are here to tell you about auditory fatigue, but a lot of times a question I get from people is, is auditory fatigue really real? Is it a truth? The medical world, Samantha and I are used to having situations where we find that uh, there's a question that's being asked. We turn to the research. We turn to studies to see what things are real, what things are not real. So the interesting thing is that auditory fatigue is proven to be a real true thing when we look at the research. So the interesting thing is that when you're working hard to listen, you do experience changes in your body, in your brain, that you're not experiencing when you're not working hard to listen. For example, your eyes change. Your pupils in your eyes increase in size when we're struggling to understand sentences. When researchers do functional MRI scans, and EEG scans, which look at um, the brain, how the brain functions, and the brain waves, we see that many areas of the brain show increased activity when we're trying to listen in noisy situations. So what that means is when you add noise, when you add that worse listening condition, then your brain is working harder. You're using more areas of your brain to try to understand what's being said. We also see with the body that your body produces more sweat moisture when you're involved in a challenging listening task. This probably doesn't mean that you're going to be like dripping sweat. Sorry for that kind of gross image. But if they do a test, of your skin sweat moisture, then you produce more sweat when you're listening to a challenging listening task. When speech is easier to understand or harder to understand, so if there's noise, if, if somebody's wearing a mask, if somebody's more than feet away, your brain is going to have to use different parts of it itself um, in order to understand. So we can see on studies that the brain is, is using more regions of the brain than when it's easy to understand. And one more research thing, um, we see that when it's clear speech versus listening and noise, 
additional areas of the brain are being activated. So our brains are truly working harder and our body is showing changes that prove that we're working really hard to listen. So we know that everybody experiences fatigue. We see that babies, children who are school-aged, teenagers, adults, older adults, everybody experiences fatigue. So, so what? The problem is, is that fatigue has some negative effects. And so three of the most documented effects of fatigue are that people have a decrease in their ability to pay attention, in vigilance, and even in memory. So these areas can all be impacted when you're experiencing fatigue. So that, that, can, be, that can be a problem. So what, what does that look like for real people? When we start talking about children, that when children are fatigued, we see that they don't do as well in their academics. So they don't do as well at school. They tend to miss more school. They have trouble participating in the normal things that they do every single day. They might fight a little bit more about doing them as sleep patterns are interrupted. There can be changes in their relationships with other people. And when they do studies looking at fatigue, the children report a negative change in their quality of life. So they feel their quality of life isn't as high when they are fatigued. So that's a big, big problem when we start talking about kids. When we start talking about adults, we see very similar things. We see more challenges at work, more absences from things like work, inability to engage in our daily meetings and clubs and responsibilities, sleep problems. Maybe it takes so much energy to talk that you don't want to participate in a conversation or go out to dinner with somebody because it's so much effort. And that all can have a, a change in your perception of your quality of life. And I just wanted to add one Oops. thing to that conversation with adults. There has been research shown that if a person has hearing loss and they go into a medical uh, facility, whether they are in the ER or they're admitted for something, they're at a much higher risk of readmission and a longer hospital stay due to what they, what they hypothesize is due to the hearing loss and the, um, the lack of um, getting the correct information. So a lot of times we see people um, bringing loved ones or friends or spouses with them um, or asking for some um, handwritten information to help them get the medical uh, information so that they, they can take care of themselves. So that was, um, we have some strategies later on that um, we can discuss about how you can promote better communication from your spouse, caregiver, healthcare worker um, to reduce those effects. Okay, we're going to pause for 30 seconds to get the captions back. Um, Sandy, can you try wiggling the mouse on your screen? Try captions again.
Okay. So I think we've got them working again. Sorry about that, everybody. So Samantha was, um, for people who missed it, was discussing some research that was showing that if you have a hearing loss, that it's associated sometimes with longer hospital stays and longer um, or higher rates of readmission. Um, and that can be due to working so hard to get the additional information and there, there's a lot of factors so it's it's bad when you're too fatigued and certainly in a hospital you would be more fatigued okay so continuing in how listening in ways impacts people in general. This was a research study that looked at adults who were in noise who did not have hearing loss. And remember, if you do have hearing loss, there's even more impact. But they studied some professionals and um, they put these hospital workers in um, extra noise at work or looked at how much noise they were already in at work. And when people worked in louder noise environments, they demonstrated increased work-related stress and they were more annoyed about noise in general at work. So when you have more noise around you, it, it's it's going to be associated with having more fatigue. That's even if you don't have a hearing loss. When we're in noisy situations, we experience more fatigue. I don't know about you, but I often feel like the woman on the screen having to rub my temples when you're in a place that's just too noisy, where you're working really hard to understand things. There's also risks of being in loud environments. There's a higher need for recovery associated um, with, with being in noise. That means that once you get out of the loud environment, it takes you longer before you feel like you want to be back in a noisy situation or go back to talking to other people. Um, it was also, um, uh, when people have a higher need for recovery and research is showing that people who have hearing loss often have more recuperation time necessary after listening for a long time, that people tend to have more health problems and have to take more time off of work than the general population. When people are in higher sound levels, so when it's noisy, and this is just people in general, not specifically people with hearing loss, it's associated with higher fatigue, so being more tired, headaches, and we put this reduced cortisol variability. So when your body is stressed, you release cortisol. And when your stress goes down, you should see your cortisol numbers not being as high. So you should see ups and downs all day long. But what they found was that when people are in sound for a lot of their day, that number doesn't change. It doesn't come down. Your body keeps producing the stress hormone throughout the day without a break. So just important to remember. When we look at hearing loss, 
we see that when people have hearing loss, that there's a risk of fatigue and vigor deficits. And for every decibel louder that the environment is, that recovery time you need, that recuperation time is increased. And the need for a lot of recovery time is increased by 9%. So for every decibel where it's harder to hear, you're going to need more time to recover and recuperate. Hearing loss by itself is independently associated with more listening effort. That means regardless of your age, regardless of where you live, whether you're male or female, no matter what, that hearing loss, if you have hearing loss, you're more likely to have increased listening effort than other people. And the fatigue is not associated with your degree of hearing loss. For those of you with hearing loss, your audiologist has probably talked to you about having a mild, moderate, severe, profound hearing loss. It doesn't matter how severe your hearing loss is, having hearing loss by itself is associated with more fatigue. We see that, whoops, let's try to go back one here. We see that when people are using more listening effort, and again, this goes back to kids, but we can, um, we can apply a lot of this to adults as well, that it's harder to multitask when you're having to listen really hard. It takes longer to process information when you have a hearing loss. And this study I included, I thought was interesting, that kids show poorer memory for short stories when they had hearing loss. However, when they were able to slow down the story and give themselves enough time to process, then they were able to have, um, they were able to understand and remember the story as well as somebody else could. Okay, so let's go here. So this is, this is the last set of studies for those of you who are getting tired of listening and feel like the little baby up there on the couch. <laughs> um, this is the last set of research. When people, and this study was with kids, when they compared children who had hearing loss of any kind to children with normal hearing, what they found is that kids had kids with hearing loss had more fatigue than kids who had chronic health conditions such as cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and obesity. The children, just by having hearing loss, had more fatigue than children with these other conditions. However, when you ask the children if they feel like they're tired or they feel fatigued, they did not feel that they were any more tired than anybody else. The important takeaway from these studies is that you can have significant amounts of fatigue and just assume that's normal. So e even if you are not always feeling fatigued, it's important to remember that you're at a higher risk of auditory fatigue when you have a hearing loss. So 
now that we've scared and depressed everybody, we're not going to leave it there because the good news is there are things we can do. We can't make it go away, but there are some things we can do to, to make it, to make it better. Okay, so the, let's see. Sorry, Samantha, I, I can't remember take if over you're here. taking, oh, I think yeah, I, I can talk take about over this. Here. Okay, you wanna yeah, we'll take do, over here? We'll do the next then, few slides, yep. Okay, um, so that way people don't have to keep listening to me it's talk. It's a good <laughs> change up. Um, but the first thing to, to battle auditory fatigue is to recognize it's real. And that's why we share the research with you because we're not just saying this um, to, you know, make you, you know, we don't just tell our patients that they have auditory fatigue because we want you to stop telling us how much you're struggling. It is a real thing. And um, we can prevent it if you anticipate it, you recognize the warning signs and you consider um, it when um, someone is not tired or they say they're not tired. Next slide. And the first step um, is using some, um, what's the next one, Lindsay? Um, I wanna talk about the amplification first before the assistive we might have missed it. Is it back one? I'm not sure that this it's was in okay. the first one. I have it okay. in front of me if you. Okay. So the first step um, to battle some of the fatigue is to wear appropriate amplification to get it and wear it. Um, hearing aids have been shown to increase cognitive capacity, which helps working memory and executive function. Um, sorry, this is a little more research too. So um, it has also, hearing aids and cochlear implants have also sh been shown to reduce listening effort, especially if you're in an auditory only situation, meaning you do not have visual cues. You are using your ears only. Um, with hearing aids, cochlear implants, word recall improved and reaction times were faster compared to the same people not wearing their devices. And when um, using hearing aids, response times remained stable, but when not using the hearing aids, response times were increased over a duration of a task. So there was less fatigue. So it didn't decrease their response time, but it showed that people had less fatigue during a task that didn't, um, uh, decrease their response time in a few research studies. So, sorry, I'm going through some slides. Um, FM systems, um, or what you might hear called DM systems. FM systems are called frequency modulating systems, and that's an older technology. So, uh, so a lot of FM systems still exist out there. Um, but what we're seeing is a lot of the newer systems coming out like the Roger pen and anything with Roger on it is actually a DM system. So it's digitally modulated uh, sound. So it's just completing the same task, but in a different way. And they believe that DM systems actually hold all of the acoustic information better than the FM systems and provide a better signal to the person using it. So, um, a lot of people might have what's called a remote mic or a mini mic, um, depending on what companies you have, Advanced Bionics, Medel, Cochlear, they call it something different. They do the same thing. It is a microphone that is going to bring speech, the person wearing it. So if you and I are at dinner, I wear the microphone, it's connected to your uh, devices. It's going to bring my voice louder then the speech around or the noise uh, uh, surrounding environmental sound. It's gonna bring my voice louder than that. 
again, reducing that auditory fatigue. So a lot of all of this, all of cochlear implant companies give people these options when they get their device because they're so helpful. And I have so many patients who don't use them. Um, I'm not fear of, is it connected? Fear of use. And maybe we can talk about that later, why some of you don't use those systems. Um, the Roger Pen too, um, there's a Roger table mic, there's a Roger pen, there's a bunch of different Roger systems that are so helpful. And the Roger systems, the DM systems provide a better sound quality than the mini mic and the remote mics, but the mini mic and remote mic provide a better sound quality than just using your devices alone in a situation where you have noise and distance and reverberation. So um, use those tools that you guys should have in your pack. And if you're not sure how to use them, all of the manufacturers are willing, they have people that they pay to come talk to you, whether it's at your home or a local coffee shop, they have people that want you to use those devices. You have your, if you don't feel like you want to bother your audiologist, you're not a bother or your um, speech language pathologist, or you don't want another appointment, talk to your manufacturer about getting, um, used to and comfortable with your devices. So when you're like, oh, we're heading out the door, I don't have to, you know, remember, is it connected or not? You're gonna be comfortable with these these technologies. So you can be comfortable to and walk out the door. Um, like I said, your, your healthcare providers certainly always willing to discuss those. And that's part of their job is to discuss those with you. But the manufacturers also have people that can do it on a Saturday or do it on a Wednesday night when you're free or whichever. Next. So Samantha, I think you yes. want to talk a little bit about some of the mask yeah. options so that are available. Anybody, so um, there are some different mask options. There's one that is um, FDA approved. It's called the communicator surgical mask. Um, and it has a clear window. So um, I'm trying to get a picture on my phone so I can show you on my screen. Um, uh, and then the there are some other mask options um, that will allow you to get the visual cues um, and maintain the the safety of you know not spreading your germs and not contracting germs. Um, I do not believe here's an image of. And, and I actually just read something that the Ford Motor Company just came out with a clear N95 mask, which is really neat. I'm looking into it. Um, it's probably not going to be available for, um, I think they're making them for a specific group of people, uh, probably healthcare workers, but um, it's it's worth knowing. So this is this is another form of a mask that is clear and allows you to see visual cues. Um, shields alone are not enough protection from um, COVID and germ spread, but they are, um, they, they're better than nothing. You know what I mean? Um, if you come into a healthcare facility, I know University Hospitals does not allow people to only wear shields. So um, it, and it doesn't hurt to even have these in your back pocket to provide a healthcare provider who doesn't have one because your podiatrist understand valuable cues are. Um, not that it's your obligation to provide these services for yourself, um, but it will take some of that load off if you feel like you're going to see your oncologist or, or, or you know, you're going to a situation that you really want to have those visual cues. Keep in mind, a lot of these facilities are not allowing you to bring a partner with you to your appointment. I know we're still, we're still in red in Cuyahoga County, so we are not um, allowing visitors in some situations. So um, the clear mask is, uh, is an option. Um, Samantha, not to yep. interrupt. I don't, I don't know if it's going to switch the camera screen to me or not here. Mine's blocked, so I can't see it. But if if my picture is showing, I am wearing a oh, clear yeah, yeah, mask. I see you. That is yeah. commercial. You see me? Okay. That um that is commercially available right now. It's called clear mask. We're not selling them, so I'm not saying these are the best that are available, but this is just an example of a clear mask. You might be able to tell that it is blocking the sound. 
-hmm. a little bit. I, I have my microphone right next to it. So you're probably still picking up my voice, but it's going to be a little muted because I'm wearing a big sheet of plastic on my face, <laughs> but it gives you more access to reading my lips, which can really help in medical situations, appointments, times when you want to communicate with somebody and need to be able to see their lips. Um, some other strategies, um, I have a list of strategies that I pulled from a research study that I'd be happy to share with um, anybody who emails me at the end of the presentation. Um, these are strategies for your partner. Um, I don't expect you all to remember these because um, it is not going to be listed on a slide. Um, but these are strategies that your spouse, your healthcare worker, you could share with somebody, you know, you all are working very hard and um, other people may not even realize that. Even somebody very close to you may not realize how hard you all are working every moment of every day. Um, but it is, um, you know, if they are not able to come to appointments and, and listen to um, your speech language pathologist or your audiologist, um, these are tips that you can share with them. Um, try not to talk to the person um, who has hearing loss while walking away from them. And these are probably communication strategies you've heard for a long time, but I feel like in the world we live in now, distance, there's like fear of being around people. Um, I feel like this very, it's, I think see some, I think there's going to be research in the coming years to show the impacts of all of this um, is having on people. Um, also, having somebody ask you, what's the best way to communicate with you? Um, face the person that you're talking to. Um, if you have a clear mask, use it and stand so that um, using speech apps, um, there are apps on your iPhone that are already there. You don't have to download anything. Um, there's apps you can download so that um, somebody can talk into their phone or your phone and it will give you a text of what's being said, similar to the captioning. Um, provide large printed font um, materials to supplement what's being communicated. So if your doctor can, if you can let your you know, healthcare worker know ahead of time that you'll be coming in and you expect something in writing, it can help prepare them so that they can um, provide you with that information. Um, Take turns when speaking, do not interrupt somebody speaking. That's just general um, manners, but people forget it, especially when they're excited to tell you something. Um, and then try to get the attention of the person you're talking to. Uh, talk slowly and raise the level of your voice slightly. Do not shout. Um, and then reducing the background noise in the situation, if at all possible. Uh, I always tell my patients, don't tell people you have hearing loss. If you tell them you have hearing loss, they will just shout at you and talk just as unclearly, and it will be worse. I always tell people, ask people to slow down and speak clearly. They tend to check themselves and correct their speech. They don't need to know you have hearing loss. It's, I mean, it's fine to advocate for yourself that you do have hearing loss, but the general person who has never experienced hearing loss thinks that they need to shout now. So, um, that is, those are some tips and strategies that your partner can use to help you reduce your fatigue. And the next one is still mine. Okay, I think this is back to you, Lindsay. Yes. So in terms of some other things you can do is you can really try to the best of your ability to make the listening situation the best possible situation for yourself. We can't make any situation perfect, but if you can get yourself a few extra decibels of sound or a little less background noise, that goes a long way in reducing your effort and or fatigue. So think about what we call strategic seating. So that means 
whenever you go someplace, look around the room and figure out where is the best place for you to be seated to be able to hear somebody. It's not always going to be up front and center. It depends. Is the person you're going to be listening to sitting down or are they going to be moving around? You're going to need to hear other people. If you have to hear other people, then being close to one speaker might not be the best place to sit. You want to sit where you can hear everybody. Looking around the room and identifying things that are noisy. For example, if you go to a restaurant in the areas where we are allowed to go to restaurants these days, try to sit away from the kitchen or a bar because those will be noisy places. Trying to avoid sitting next to speakers um, that are playing music, for example, is a way to make it a little bit quieter. Another thing to consider with strategic seating would be, um, uh-oh, my voice is loud and tinny, I'm finding out here in the comments. <laughs> I hope I'm not screaming at people. Um, but in terms of strategic seating, thinking about um, what else in the room is, is happening. Um, if you need to sit by somebody who you want to talk to at Thanksgiving, then make sure you're close to them and not necessarily at the opposite end of the table. Using your FM or DM systems when it's, um, when it's a noisier situation, but thinking in each situation where you can be to turn it into the quietest place. In your kitchen, you don't wanna be by a running dishwasher. Those are noisy. If you're in the family room and the television is on, that's a great opportunity to turn the TV off when you're going to have a conversation. So strategically thinking about what's going on so that you can give yourself the best possible place. and the best possible listening conditions. Another thing to consider is listening breaks. That's gonna be a small amount of time where you're not accountable for processing what you hear. So that boiled down basically means that a small amount of time where it doesn't matter what you're hearing, you're not gonna be in trouble if you don't hear it. You can give yourself a break from listening every certain number of minutes. So for every hour of listening, you need five or 10 minutes of quiet, for example, or you can do it with associated with specific events. For example, before I have lunch, I'm going to take a couple of minutes of quiet. After I finish with this Great Lakes meeting, I'm going to sit in quiet for a little bit so I can recuperate. Listening breaks can be formal or informal, so you can plan them or you can take them whenever you're feeling tired. Or if you don't necessarily feel tired, but you notice that you're having more trouble understanding somebody than what you were 10 minutes ago, that's a great time to take a break. You can take a trip to a water fountain. You can take some quiet reading time. Even a strategic bathroom break when you're at a restaurant or at a social event is a great way to give yourself a couple of minutes of quiet. It does not when you're, always, I'm sorry, I just said don't interrupt, just interrupted. Does not always mean taking your implant off. Correct. For some people, it they feel it helps that they take their implant off for a minute or two, go ahead and put it on. After you recuperate, you should be able to put it back on. Other people feel that when they take that cochlear implant off, 
it, it's added some more stress. It's more inability to communicate. And so sometimes you can actually make it worse by taking that implant off. When you're going like meetings, asking for CART or for captioning can be very helpful then rather than just listening the whole time. Um, looking for notes if you're at a meeting from your colleagues or minutes or an agenda ahead of time can be very helpful. Um, when you're going to be watching a video for something that's work related, making sure that it's captioned and you have access to the captions. Um, and then there are different accommodations for phone conversations that can be requested um, if that helps you to do your job better, for example. Okay, and I'm going to turn it back over to Samantha, who's going to lead us through some practice time here. All right, so you can use your chat you can uh, to answer some of these questions. We're just going to do some scenarios. I like to hear from you guys because you guys are uh, the people that experience it and do it um, are the most uh, creative and intuitive people I know. And so um, let's go into some different situations um, that you can practice some of the things we've given you and share with the group things that have worked for you. So you are at a party at someone's house and you're starting to not understand what is being said. Um, using your chat, does anyone want to share what you might do to help you know, recognize, you've now recognized you're not understanding and maybe relieve some of that auditory fatigue. Um, you can share in the chat or you can think of it you know, privately with yourself. So um, in that situation, I'm, oh, good. Um, Mr. Art has provided us. I have found that popping off my CI coil for just a few seconds can reset my hearing a bit. That's great. Cochlear's processors have a very annoying rumbling in the background when using the e coil, the newest one, the N7 is a lot quieter. Very, that's a really good point, but still annoying. Okay. I have found it necessary to go back to my old N5 and the personal cable to hear the audio loop equipment with no annoying interference. That's a really good point. Sometimes these technologies are not the appropriate technology for you. And then it sounds like in this case for Jay, uh, he recognized that the T coil was actually causing more interference and frustration and um, though he's going back to old technology, it's still um, beneficial for him. And Dave said he might go outside for a while, maybe take a walk or just, you know, remove yourself from the party. Okay, so um, the next one, you're in a group. So whether you're at a book club or, or a meeting or a Bible study, and you're starting to get a headache, what can you do in that situation? Or what have you done in that situation? What could you do right now when you've been listening to Samantha and me for about an hour? What could you do if you're starting to get a headache right now? Nice. Allie G said that she, uh, may go get a glass of water, which so not only is she hydrating, because maybe the headache is unrelated to us, or maybe it is, but it it's a notary break. Water's a good idea. Bathroom break, Dave said, yes. Walk away from it, take a break from it. The nice thing about this is it's being recorded. You can go back, um, but you know, I think most people, if you let them know, hey, I missed something, they're willing to uh, fill you in while you're away. All right. 
What's the next scenario? All right, I'll just, is it coming? In theory, it's coming. <laughs> oh, there it is. So you look ahead at your schedule, at your calendar, and you see that you have lots of events scheduled for the day. Um, what might you do? You know, maybe you have a few doctor's appointments and a meeting and you're meeting a friend for lunch. What might you do in anticipation for that day? Good, Dorothy Miller said she might reschedule one of those meetings. And Dave um, also said he may take a rest before an event, you know, I think it might, if, if you suffer with auditory fatigue, um, even if you feel like you don't stop, suffer with it, because as the research has shown, most people don't recognize that they are suffering from it, um, schedule in a break, you know, schedule in some time to sit in your car, maybe don't put back-to-back -back meetings so you can get to the restaurant and you can sit in silence and maybe do some, whatever helps you clear your mind for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, keeping your processor on, but also getting that quietness, um, I think is really, um, really important. And I think could really benefit you as you go into that next situation that's going to be difficult or could be difficult. So now we're asking in your chat, we had a bunch of people in the beginning tell us how tired they are. How tired are you right now? So one is not tired, 10 is um, your battery's completely exhausted. Think about as you're doing this, what was your answer before we started, before you sat here for, for an hour listening? Think about what your number is now compared to compared to that. Yeah, it's really, I really appreciate you guys participating. That's great. Cause that was an hour of, you know, most of you, I don't, I think I actually, I don't know if most of you are sitting in quiet because I can't hear you, but um, still too, not feeling any more tired than we started. Great art. Um, Charlene's at a one. Some people are at fours and sixes. You see twos and threes. Good. And remember, it's a, it's okay to feel a little bit more, or it, it's maybe not okay, but it's normal to feel more fatigued now. So some people aren't going to notice much more fatigue after listening to this. For some people, this was probably a very challenging listening environment and figuring out the technology was hard. Interesting, Barbara. I like that input from you. Uh, she said uh, she feels tired often and she never related it to auditory fatigue, which I think is a very real um, vulnerable thing to say. And uh, I appreciate it. So I think that's it for me and Lindsay, as far as slides go. Um, we are gonna hang around for a little bit. I think we're gonna stop the recording just to kind if, of have, go if ahead, If people had questions, I'm so sorry I interrupted, but if people have questions, then um, you can either type them into chat. That's probably the best way. Um, if you don't have access to chat, you can come off of your um, mute to ask the question, but make sure you tell us your name first so that we have the opportunity to get your uh, picture on the screen since it's easier to listen when we can see people. And I'm going to take a one minute break and I'll be right back. And I will be here and can start ans answering any questions that come up. Lindsay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello. How are you? Nice to see you again. Great to see you. 
Dave, this is Dave here. I, I know exactly who okay. this is. I'm um, thank you I for telling ask, us. Did you get some more letters after your name? <laughs> nope. Same credentials as always. Way okay. too many letters after my name. How's it going? Okay, though. It's going very well. Thank you. Okay. Just just wanted to say hello. That's I appreciate the uh, presentation. I just wish that my wife, every time I, I tell her about auditory fatigue, she doesn't believe it. So I, w I wish she believed it, you know. I wonder if, if any of the other members, their family don't believe it either. I was just wondering that. So that'd be my question. Okay, so let's hear from everybody out there. Um, what has your experience been? Do people seem to believe you when you're saying that you're so tired from listening? Or is that something that they're not, is that a concept maybe that they're not familiar with either? While we're letting people. This is Sandy speaking. And what came to mind for me is when I'm in the car with my husband and um, it doesn't matter who's driving, but let's say I'm driving. He likes to have the radio on all the time, all the time. I don't put the radio on very much at all. I, I might listen to the news, but if I need to think about where I'm going, or if I think I might be getting lost, um, I gotta turn all the sound off. And it, it, it not just in the car, but in other situations where I need to figure something out, it needs to be quiet because the input, the auditory input is way too much uh, when I add it to my intellectual effort. And I'm imagining that that's partly because I'm, you know, I'm challenged uh, auditorially. So I thought I'd share that. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, it looks like Dorothy's saying too that she shares the uh, radio problem as well. And that is very hard for people to understand that when the radio is going, that's two different types of noise. That's the instrument sounds and that's the lyrics. So that's another speaker as well. It's very challenging to listen in that situation. And it's common for everyone, hearing loss or no hearing loss, when we get lost, we often turn off the radio because background noise makes you think more. You have to think harder. You need to process more. So it's one way of turning off extra information so that you can concentrate on what's important. So Margaret's asking a great question. Why do people go to bars after a whole day of work? More music and noise must be really exhausting. And uh, yeah, you know, I think we all do these things because they're social and they're considered to be a restful, fun activity, but a lot of people can't do that after a full day of work. It's, it's too much. Um, maybe some people here have had that experience where you get home and you realize you have plans after a whole day that was busy and it's really hard to bring yourself to go do the plans. Uh, people need that recuperation time. And some of us need a few minutes of recuperation time. And some of us need hours. So that that's great. I don't know if other people have had that experience too, where you just don't feel like you even want to, to go to that next thing. Yeah. And, and Honestly, some of those situations are not providing them the relaxation that they really think they're seeking and getting. Um, I think for some people, you know, going and like Lindsay said, being social and kind of taking your mind off the other stressors of your life, but doing it in a noisy bar is probably not um, recharging their battery, but they don't know that. Well, it looks as though the questions have kind of uh, slowed down here. So, oh, go this, ahead. I got one more question. What Sandy was saying about in the car, maybe they, you should have a meeting like this with all the spouses 
Because a lot of times when I'm driving with my wife in the car, she's looking out her window on the passenger side and she's talking. I, she's talking to the window. She ain't talking to me. Mm -hmm. so maybe you should think about that in the future. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. I so, think that's a really good point. And I know Sandy and uh, all of the other people who put this uh, group together do a bunch of different topics and they're always looking for additional topics too. So maybe a car strategies or car etiquette or just an environmental with your spouse <laughs> etiquette kind of presentation. And the nice thing too with these virtual visits or virtual visits, can you tell I've been in an office with these virtual meetings is that it, since they're being recorded and we'll keep them in a video library, if there's a topic that you want your spouse to to hear about, you'll be able to share the video with them whenever they're ready to watch it. Yep. Yep. We have a question. You know, uh, one more thing, Dave, is that I know that uh, I have often used my FM equipment with my husband in the car and I have him wear the microphone and then it doesn't matter if he turns his head or not, I can hear him. Good point. Okay. Uh, I, I think a question, please. Yes. Okay. Um, I just was wondering if the um, thank you, first of all, for coming here. It's just wonderful that both of you could give us this presentation today. But I just wondered if you could widen the focus a little bit on the issue of stress, not so much in what is a um, obvious fatigue. Um, you know, invitation, like going to a noisy party or something, but just in general, the stress of hearing loss, it, it almost seems like there's an overlay, a constant overlay in a way of, of a degree of stress. Is that? Is that Absolutely, that's true. True, do you think? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think there's a whole, not that you guys want to hear the research, but we can I think that could be a whole topic and presentation of itself um, because it is stressful. And, um, you know, I think, and again, having spouses or people you're with recognizing that um, I don't have any research off the top of my head um, that I can share, but I think it's a, it's a great point and I think it should be taken and doing a entire presentation on it. I think with hearing loss, it's important to remember that hearing loss is very unique. When we talk about experiences people can have in their life, hearing loss impacts people in a very different way than a different medical condition might impact people. Hearing impacts communication and there are very few situations in our life that don't involve communication. And that opens the door to all forms of different types of stress. There's so many different types of stress. Um, so when you are working hard, you're going to have the fatigue, and that's stressful. You're processing more, that's stressful. People aren't understanding you or aren't taking that extra step that you've asked them 1 million times to do to help communicate, that's stressful. That you have to plan your order of events for the day is added stress. There's so many parts of having hearing loss that can add stress to people's lives. And a lot of it goes back to communication and interpersonal relationships, but certainly those aren't the only stressors. Um, you know, work is in there. there, there's so many. So I think the very, very short version answer would be to find your outlets and people that you can talk to, find ways of those things that are in your control to reduce the stress that you can control and if it's getting to the point where it's too much stress or it's starting to impact your health, 
your mental health or how you're thinking about things, then that's an opportunity where you do need to reach out to somebody else to, to get some extra help um, and to get help more at a professional level. So we don't want anybody feeling stressed to that point. And if you are, then you need to reach out to the appropriate professional. But it's important to recognize that even if you're not at that level with your stress, that you can experience a lot of stress. It can be chronic. It can be all day long, every day. So you need to be thinking about some of those self-help things, some of those ways of reducing stress and modifying what you can in the environment to try to reduce the stress as much as possible. I, I know that's not a great answer, but as uh, Samantha said, we certainly could do a whole we could do a week long class on, <laughs> on stress and, and that kind of thing, but hopefully that gives a, a little bit of information. Thank you. And I see some questions in the chat. So um, the first one is which speech to text apps do you recommend? And I'm gonna send that over to Lindsay. Okay, so there's a lot of paid speech to text apps um, and there's, they all have their pros and their cons to them. Um, what I've been using the most with people, in all honesty, is um, I, I do have um, an iPhone, and app, so Apple products, but the iPhone and the iPad have a note feature. And if you go to the open the notes on your phone, for example, and there's a, a microphone, Sorry, there's a microphone in the bottom corner of that note page and it will caption everything. It'll do speech to text. It's free and it's something that a lot of people already have. So that um, that's kind of what I recommend. Um, there is a website and I'm totally forgetting, I know who puts it on, but I can't remember the website. So I'll try to look at that and, um, and maybe I can have the group send it out. Um, or if people want to email me, they're welcome to email me um, and I can get you a website that lists a lot of speech to text apps. Um, it's put together by a woman who has um, hearing loss and who has cochlear implants and she's very, very tech savvy and she puts out um, what she considers to be the pros and the cons of each app. So I put my emails on the screen. I also put it in the chat. You're welcome to email me for that. Um, and I can see if I can send something out um, for additional uh, speech to text apps. Um, the next question is how do we view recordings um, of this Zoom meeting and the group, this uh, Great Lakes support group, CI support group is going to create a YouTube channel and they will be able to download these recordings and upload it onto the YouTube channel. So um, I'm sure once the logistics of it get figured out, they will send out a link um, and then it'll, it will be able to be searched on YouTube, but you can also join and follow the Great Lakes support group um, so when there are new videos out, it'll come up on your YouTube uh, sign in. Yes, so that link will be shared um, probably on Great Lakes um, Cochlear Implant Group's um, website when it is available. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be available as a link. I'm hoping this week. Um, and so you'll be able to click on that. And that's something that um, Shirley Ann, for example, might be able to send out through that group um, email that tells about it. If, if you aren't on Shirley Ann's list and want to be, if you go to um, the website, it's www.greatlakesci.com. Um, if you go to that website, you have an opportunity in there to put in your name and your email address, and then um, you can be added to the list. 
but that will be where those videos are. It will be through YouTube and you'll just select the video you want and you can rewatch something, watch it for the first time or share it with somebody. Okay, I think that was all of our questions. I know the group wanted to have some opportunity to um, share questions and answer time unrelated to auditory fatigue. So um, I, I think at this point, we can turn it back over to, uh, to Sandy. And um, Sandy's going to stop the recording for this portion of it so that 